I'm again grateful to be before you once more on this beautiful Lord's Day. If you would be turning to the second epistle epistle of Peter, chapter 2, we'll read three verses from that chapter which will serve as our text this afternoon. Second Peter, chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. There the apostle writes, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein, and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. The Holy Spirit, through Peter, paints a very disgusting picture here, and it is one of apostasy, which is what we would like to discuss this afternoon. Now this term apostasy simply means to abandon a belief whether a religious belief or even a political belief. In the context of Scripture, though, to apostatize is to abandon the very will of God or fall away from Him. The one who does this has turned away from God and His will for them. And as a result, they seek after their own personal way of doing things. Because you're going to do either your own will or somebody else's will. By doing the latter, you're making it your own will. For those that would read their Bibles and have and familiar with this passage, we know that it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 23. So you see, if we do apostatize, we will be following our own will rather than God's. Now, many in the religious world today claim that apostasy is impossible. They cling to a once saved, always saved doctrine. They claim that once they have some sort of emotional experience, that sometime after that they have received salvation, at least what they call salvation. And then they can go about their lives doing as whatever they want, and as if God has no standard or even if he exists at all. Either way, they consider them their own selves saved. I've heard it stated before that, you know, I'm just an imperfect person, which gives me license to sin however which way I want and how frequently I may want. And despite all that, God will still save me in my unfaithfulness. They would even go further to say that if one ever did seem like they apostatized, if they ever fell away, that, well, they were never actually a part of the faith. They never actually had faith. They were not actually saved. Thus, they never apostatized. They were never saved in the beginning. Well, as children of God, we should be more concerned of uh, thus saith the Lord. So this afternoon we would be seeking after, uh, thus saith the Lord. What do the scriptures teach, if anything, about apostasy? Falling away from God. We know that, first off, that apostasy is a real danger. Apostasy has been around for quite some time. Have you ever heard of King Saul? King Saul, before he was king, Saul was chosen by God to rule Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 15 through 17. We see that he was a humble man. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 21. He was called to be a part of the, the celebration and acceptance, and he wanted nothing of it. That's a good trait to have, being, being humble. We see that he was faithful to God. 
And he even expected the same from the citizens of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 7. However, as his reign progressed, we see that he eventually became unfaithful. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, he was commanded to utterly destroy the Amalekites. Now he partially did that. Later we read in verses 5 and five through 9 that King Agdag was kept alive, as well as the choice livestock. Now certainly there was good intentions involved there, but he did not obey God. Not fully, which results in disobedience. We see later in that chapter, verses 22 and 23, where Samuel rebuked him for his behavior. And the verses following, verses 26 and 28, King Saul even repented. However, as a result of his sin of disobedience, the kingdom was taken away from him. Next, we would think about King Amaziah of Judah, 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verses 14 through 27. Very similar instance. He was commanded to have battle with the Edomites, and he discharged that obligation. However, when the battle was over, he took some of their idols, and he even set them up later on and worshipped them. Because of this, Israel slew him. Then we see the example of Hymenaeus and Alexander in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Paul names them, and while he's writing to encourage Timothy to be a faithful member or a faithful preacher, and he contrasts them to how one should act. He says that he had, de he had delivered them to Satan. Well, this would be a demonstration of a withdrawal of fellowship. The reasoning there, though, is because they had apostatized. It was said of them that they destroyed the vessel of their faith. They made shipwreck their faith in their own lives. In verse 20 there, as we stated, he had basically withdrawn fellowship from them, as all the faithful brethren should have as well. Then we see Demas, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, where he forsook Paul and went after the world. When his faith was put to the test, he'd rather be in love with the world rather than loving God's will. And then we see the Galatians. They received this sentiment from the hand of Paul. Galatians 5, chapter 5, verse 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. You see, these brothers and sisters were in a state of, of saving grace. They were saved. They were Christians. They had been added to the church. But they were backsliding. They were going back to the law of Moses. And as a result of that, they had fallen from grace. At this point in their faith, at this point in their lives, they were no longer able to be affected by Christ, their Savior, due to their own apostasy. Secondly, we would like to consider some reasons for apostasy. What reason could there be for such a thing? What would cause a Christian to so turn away from God's grace, from the forgiveness that is found only in Christ Jesus? and from the hope of eternal life in heaven when this life in the flesh is over. These would be some external forces, if you will. One reason for apostasy would be persecution. Jesus foretold these things in Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 through 10, where he warned his apostles about upcoming persecution. In the early days of Christianity, they had a real problem of persecution. They were fed to lions, they were beaten with rocks, they were stoned, they were scourged, and some of them were even put to death for believing in Christ and confessing Him before others. These were real possibilities for our brethren of the first century. Now today, we are, I guess you could call it a blessing. We don't actually have to deal with such a thing. Instead, we have to we face getting ridiculed. It might come in the form of 
getting excluded from different events, from, you know, not being a part of the, the cliques, the crews that most people set up. They might exclude us from different things. And that might be the most persecution we face. And it could even be being made fun of. Well, you're just a Bible thumper. Well, there's a lot to be said about that. But either way, that's the, the form of persecution that we now usually will have to face. Now, I dare say that that will be changing and has been changing for quite some time. Our world is getting more and more militant against those who would, maybe not even necessarily Christians as defined by the New Testament, but those who would be religious to some extent or the other are facing different things more and more. A second external force that would lead to apostasy would be false teachers. False teachers are, are a very damaging force for apostasy. We know from Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, and in Paul's writing to them that there were many that were attacking Paul, attacking not only his apostleship, but really his authority to speak on any religious matter. Jesus warned that these false teachers would come, Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 through 11. Now, false teachers are followed primarily for two reasons. Primarily, they might sound good. They're charismatic. They're easily swaying people. And they cause the people to follow them rather than to seek after God's truth. And typically, people swallow that up because, well, this individual has a good reputation. Thus, his drivel is, that's spouted is believed as quickly as it's preached. Then you have the weak members that would prefer soft preaching. They would rather have the peace and love and happiness. I think of the, the Joe's Crab Shack church, the peace, love, and crab. That's where most people are nowadays. We want peace, love, and, and joy and happiness. We don't want to hear the sound doctrine, the reality, and the hatred that we should have of evil. Paul warns us of this sad fact in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. He there says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall, shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. We are certainly living in those times now and have been for quite some time. Instead, we should be more like those noble Bereans of old in Acts chapter 17, verse 11 where we would even test an apostle for the things that he would say to compare it to the very will of God to make sure that what he's teaching is the truth. That should be done to everybody that decides to speak behind a pulpit. Everyone. We should also follow after the example of John the Apostle, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, in testing the spirits. For not all spirits are of God, but it's up to us to determine whether they are not or they are, based on the very will of God that we've been given. Next, we would consider some, I guess you could call internal forces, that would lead to apostasy. First and foremost, the temptation of evil allures many. That evil practice is very appealing. The people that would fall into this category are basically the seed talked about in Luke chapter 8, verses 6 and 13, where they are the rocky soil. The word is preached to them. They believe for a little while, but as quickly as they grew, they, they wither just as fast. Unfortunately, the pleasures of this life, the pleasures of this world, attract a great many people. Next, you have a moral lapse. You know, one could one can turn back to the world even temporarily after coming to full knowledge of the truth, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, and then just give up. Forsaking a worship and spiritual living, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 31. Forsaking the assembly is a lot like symptoms of a disease. It points to another problem at hand. This individual that is okay with doing such things, that is forsaking the assembly, they lose touch with the body. Think about if you cut your finger off. It's going to wither and, and just decompose. 
Well, I wouldn't recommend doing that, but that's exactly what happens to the members of the church who cut themselves off from that spiritual body. They would prefer different settings to the church pews, bleachers as it might be, um, their own bed. If I don't wake up, I don't have to go to worship. If you resolve in your mind even the week before to go to worship, you will be there. Unfortunately, many have to decide whether or not they're going to wake up on time to go to worship that very morning. This behavior simply shows an attitude of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. And even while some are present in the worship assembly, they're physically here. What are they doing? Are they actively participating in the worship? Are they singing? Are they focusing on the prayer as it's led? What are they doing while the lesson's preached? These are valid questions. But we're here to worship. And that worship not only benefits us as Christians as we're pleasing our Creator, but it causes us to grow and to better worship the next time. The common theme through all these is that there is no maintained spiritual growth. If you're not growing, you are dying. Rather than following the command to grow, as in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, many would rather stay stagnant in their spiritual growth. And ultimately, spiritually, they wither and die. This all can be summed up very well in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are becoming such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age. And even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. There's something wrong with the 30-year-old that has to rely on formula for sustenance. We understand that in physical development. I know I, we were talking about steaks in, this, in the Bible class this morning. I, I look forward to having a, a steak. I couldn't do that if I didn't have teeth. Well, thanks to my physical development... I can enjoy a steak. Now this next portion I admittedly borrowed from Ira Rice and Brother John Renshaw. They gave this following eight-step diagram for the road to apostasy, the steps to apostasy. They outlined that success, growth, and prosperity is the first step. Well, those things sound nice. But you see, wealth, power, prominence, and prestige, they can bring us a false sense of security. They can bring us pride. Well, our numbers are finally up. We've actually doubled the number of people who are in worship. Well, that might sound nice, but where are they uh, spiritually? Physical numbers are one thing, but how are we growing spiritually? We typically gauge things by things that are physical not really spiritual second they consider the degree mania we want all of our children to have a good education we want to have them sent to any school that will have them whether it's at our own expense or the taxpayer and that school grouping might include those that are false teachers as being our student, our child's teacher. And the ignorant parents would be okay with that. Now that could apply to any secular school or particularly a religious school. And then we go on from there to upgrade these Christian schools. You know, originally these schools were established to teach the truth. Are they still doing that? Well, in order to main, maintain funding, well, maybe we'll add another department and we'll not focus on the truth so much. Well, that becomes a very dangerous situation because now we've focused our education from the truth on something else while still maintaining that we are a, a preaching training school or a religious school in general. 
All in the name of becoming like the schools around them, just like Israel of old. Fourth, the acceptance of new versions of the Bible. This was so adequately pointed out on, on Wednesday night in our devotional period that specifically with the NIV version, the New Irreverent version, this type of Bible, if you would call it that, is disgusting. We must dedicate our search to finding the best version that would adequately represent the original language that the Bible is written in. The NIV simply does not do that. And there are a whole host of other translations, transliterations, whatever you want to call them, that simply do not meet that test. Well, if we start using those different versions, it's going to be a whole lot easier to preach false doctrine from that printed page because it's our standard now. And the use of these different versions is nothing more than the work of Satan. Fifth, they point out that apostasy can, can be helped by the domination of colleges. You see, these graduates from the schools are more loyal to the school itself rather than the doctrine, the Bible, to God. That's not how it should be. We have more school pride than we do for Jehovah God himself. Just like the secular colleges. I went to Sam Houston and I enjoyed my time there. I got my degree and I left. I've been to maybe one football game and that was there for a cookout to help fundraise for a powerlifting meet. It's a school. It got me my sheepskin. It served its purpose. Now move on. Unfortunately, many people fall in love with their school and promote it over the truth whether that would be a Bible school or a secular school such as Sam Houston or take your pick. And continuing on with this, this version usage, the sixth point here would be they would adopt the new version terminologies. Well, whenever you use a questionable standard, is it any wonder that you're going to eventually start using questionable terms, questionable speech? Obviously, the words we use will start coming from that standard. If you are unable to call that which is good, good, and that which is evil, evil, there's a problem. In fact, there is no use for you in the Lord's army, which stems from an improper translation, improper version of the Bible. Building on that, we, we begin accommodating errors found in those translations, those different versions. If we use the book, we accept the text found in it. We start employing the language it uses. Error naturally follows. Thus, we're going to start finding new ways to justify it, to promote it, to make it sound pleasing to others. And at that point, we have gone beyond God's word, which is our pattern. You can look at different church billboards. They have different meeting times listed. They would have the traditional worship period at 9 o'clock. And then maybe two hours later, they have their not-so-traditional period of worship. And then they have their more progressive time for worship. That says quite a bit more than that sign actually verbally says. That's where we've come. You can look at that on any billboard that is usually LED, and they point to that. Well, the traditional, in other words, would be as God would have it. And the other two, we've got different labels on them, but we want to attract a different audience. We want to accept everybody, because mainly we're, we're working for that contribution. We want to keep the lights on. We're not necessarily focused on preaching the truth. And then step eight, you're in apostasy. You see the stages that it took. We see those stages really outlined in the first psalm. Eventually, you're right there with those scorners. You're sitting there with them. You're enjoying their company. You're just like them. Even though at one point you started out faithful to God, but you allowed yourself through process of time to succumb to their influence. Now, ultimately, apostasy stems from the lack of respect for God's word. 
his authority, which is where he placed it, the Bible. This is evidenced in the different attempts that have been made to tear down the truth, to tear down any of those who might be proclaiming it. You see, the, the inspiration of the Bible is attacked. It's just written by fallible men, after all. These people have a false view of the church at large. They have, they have a false view of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. They would hold a theistic evolution in, very, in its various forms. They attack the eldership. We've seen that quite a bit. And not just an individual group of men, but the concept of an eldership. We want to throw off any type of authority. But usually what that means is, I'm going to be the one in authority. Then we see women in leadership roles in public assemblies. And then later on we'll see participation with denominations. We'll have a community fish fry or whatever to, to raise money for some type of mission trip in the Congo. Such, such things are sinful, but that's showing a lack of respect for biblical authority. Fifth, we note that there is a terrible toll in apostasy. When you take the Beltway or even the Grand Parkway, that's a terrible toll. From 45 to I-10 and Katy, it's a $10 toll bill just to use the Grand Parkway. Well, thankfully our money is going to perish with us. Apostasy is longer lasting. Thus, we need to be much more concerned about it. As we read from our text in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, there it's pointed out that the end is worse than the beginning. Well, why is this? It's pointed out that it was better to never have known Jesus. And it was, never, it was better to never have obeyed his gospel. Well, we're given two illustrations to further this concept. And both of which are pretty graphic. The dog returning to his vomit. You see, what made that dog sick in the beginning is now his meal once more. That's the apostatizing brother. The Christian that leaves the faith and gives up God's will for their own returns to his false way of old. And the sow there mentioned, wallowing in the mire. I think of these, these fairs where they'll wash the pig in buttermilk and get it all pretty. And then five minutes later, that little sow is right back in that mud hole. Well, many brethren are that way as well. The Christian could full well abandon God, and now they're, come, they're covered by the filth of sin. These both resemble labels that Jesus himself gave in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. No matter how pure one once was, whenever one rejects God, this is how he views them. Their soul now is sin-stained. We know that the gospel of God is God's power to save mankind. Romans 1, chapter, or chapter 1, verse 16. When that gospel is rejected, his power is now unavailable to that person. If God's saving power is now unavailable, that individual is lost. To leave salvation is to return to damnation. And unfortunately, many have fallen into that trap. As we have studied this afternoon, apostasy is not just some mental construct for, I guess, people that don't know what they're talking about. As we stated earlier, the, the dominational concept is if they, if they seem to fall away, they were never really saved. They were never really a part of us. But the fact of the matter is, apostasy is real, it is possible, and it must and it can be avoided. We must avoid it at all costs. We do this by holding to the truth of God's word, Revelation chapter 2, verse 25, as well as chapter 3, verse 3. By clinging to that word, we're now able to weigh our own lives against that standard, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. And if we do that every day of our lives, we'll be able to live faithful unto death. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. The way of the cross is difficult at times. It's a very difficult path. 
You look at Jesus on his way to, to be crucified. He bore his cross. That same event is expected of us. He died for our sins. We should be willing to carry our own burden, to carry that cross that he carried for our own sins. As the song goes, he paid a debt he didn't know. And we owe a debt that we could never pay. But we need to use our very being to attempt to. Now, though the, the path is difficult, for those who would endure, heaven will be their home. Heaven will be their reward. Now, if this appeals to you in any way, and you are not a child of God, why not take the steps to become one this afternoon? Or maybe you already are a child of God, and you've allowed the world to influence your life. Maybe you're on the edge of apostasy. You don't have to fully apostatize. You can put away the sin that is in your life through repentance and prayer. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. As we sang a few moments ago, there is a great day coming. Are you ready? So whatever the need may be, whether you need to put away sin as a child of God or become a child of God for the first time today, please help us. Let us help you as together we stand and sing.